I'm now going to show you an example of how we do path planning for a manipulator. For this example, I'm going to assume we're using a spherical manipulator so that I can show you what the difference is between revolute and prismatic joints in our path planning operation. So here I have a cylindrical manipulator that I'm finishing up drawing for you. And I'm going to right away draw my zero frame on this manipulator because this is the Cartesian frame that I will use to specify the Cartesian uh, locations of the end effector. Now to set up this problem, I'm going to introduce a couple of locations to serve as our start and end locations for this path planning operation. I'm going to put one point right over here and I'm going to put another point, let's say, right over here. And for now, I'm going to make both of these have locations that have a Z position of zero because I'm simulating a pick and place operation. But this same procedure works regardless of what the X, Y, Z positions are of the start and end points. So I'm going to say that this is the start point. And I'm going to give it uh, a position in Cartesian coordinates of x equal to 5, y equal to 4, and z equal to 0. And I'll say that this is my end point. Location in Cartesian coordinates of 5 in the x direction, negative 4 in the y direction, and 0 in the z direction. I've chosen this location as my end point because I want this to be a relatively simple example. But again, the procedure that we follow will be the same regardless of the location of the start and end points. I'm also going to suppose in this example that I know that the path that I want the end effector to follow between the start and the end points is a half circle. I'm going to attempt to draw this here. If I can, I'll explain what this drawing is supposed to signify. This is the path that I want the end effector to follow, and I will define this as being a half circle. And this half circle lies in the plane of yz. It has a radius equal to 4, because it's a distance of 4 in this direction, and also a distance of 4 here. And so this is going to be a half circle with a radius equal to 4. Now, I'm going to follow our uh, seven-step procedure to plan the path of this end effector between the start and end points along my half circle path. So here I've scrolled back up to the top of our seven step procedure for path planning and I see that step number one is to find the workspace in configuration space. So I'm going to go back down now to my spherical manipulator and I'm going to find its workspace in configuration space. Now, our manipulator has two angles, theta 1, theta 2, and it also has one displacement variable, which I'll call d3. And I give it the 3 subscript here because it affects the 3 frame. I have the 0 frame that I've drawn in here. I could have drawn in a 1 frame, the 2 frame, and then the 3 frame on the end effector. So when I draw the configuration space for this manipulator, it will have 3 axes, theta 1, theta 2, and d3. Now, to find my workspace within the configuration space, I have to make some assumptions about my manipulator. 
In this case, I'm going to assume that the range for theta 1 will be 0 to 180 degrees. Uh, for theta 2, I'm going to assume that can be um, also 0 to 180 degrees. Or actually, in this case, I think I'm going to have this be um, negative 180 to 180 degrees. I, I made that change because I realized that if I restricted theta 2 to be between 0 and 180, I might not be able to reach these two start and end points. And for this example, I want to make these start and end points be in the workspace so that we can see how that, uh, how that works. I'm also going to assume that the range for D3 uh, is between 0 and 10, and I'll use the units here of centimeters. And I'm going to stick with the units of centimeters all the way through my example. So these numbers here will also represent centimeters. So now that I've defined the ranges for each of my variables, I can go back to my configuration space and define the workspace. So theta 1 ranges from 0 to 180. And I'm going to color the line in between here to indicate that this is the included range, not the excluded range. Then I need to indicate the negative 180 to 180 range of theta 2. So I'm just going to go ahead and extend this axis out here so that I can show a negative 180 to 180 range there. And then I said that the range for D3 was 0 to 10 centimeters. So I'll show that range here, 0 to 10 centimeters. And now that defines for me a rectangle. And I'm going to try and show that here. So here we have my workspace shown in configuration space. And the workspace is the inside of this rectangle. You can see that the inside of this, this three-dimensional rectangle includes all of these green spaces that I that I colored to show that that's the included workspace of my manipulator. So now that I have this workspace defined in the configuration space, I'm going to scroll back up and see what step two is. Step two is to find the start and end points in Cartesian space. I've already defined those two points on my kinematic diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go down here and I'm going to draw a Cartesian coordinate frame that I can use for all of my Cartesian calculations. So this will be x, y, and z. I'm going to draw my start and end points here. So the start point was 5, 4, 0, and the end point was 5, negative 4, 0. I'll have that point represent 5, 4, 0, and 5, negative 4, 0 will be over here. I'll just draw this y-axis into the negative, and I'll go ahead and label these points. So I've got that step done. Let's go ahead and move on to step number three. Step three is to transform the start and end points to configuration space, that is, from Cartesian space, using the inverse kinematics. 
I'm not going to derive the inverse kinematics here because we did that previously in robotics one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go and get the inverse kinematics that have been derived previously and I'm going to use them. So I'll write them down here real quick. Here I have the inverse kinematics that give me the joint variable values if I put in x, y, and z. You'll see that I also need to know the link lengths at this point, a1, a2, and a3. So I'm going to go back up to my kinematic diagram and I'm going to label these lengths. This will be a1, this is a2. These are just the standard definitions of the link lengths from our derivations of the uh, spherical manipulator. Here's a3. But I need to assume some values in order to do the, these calculations. So I'm going to give you some values for these right away. So I'm going to assume for this problem that a1 is equal to 10 centimeters, a2 is equal to 8 centimeters, and a3 is equal to 2 centimeters. Of course, when you're doing this problem on a real manipulator, what you would do to get these values is you would have to go out and actually measure your manipulator to see what the actual lengths are of these distances. But for this example problem, we'll assume these lengths for a1, a2, and a3. Also, I'm right away going to make a little change here because I just realized that actually um, my end point is going to end up not being in the workspace of this manipulator because I've made theta 1 range from 0 to 180. And so it would need to turn in the negative direction or beyond 180 in order to reach the end point. So I'm going to change this assumption. Instead of being from 0 to 180, I'm going to make this range from negative 90 to 90. So I'm going to go change that right away in, in my uh, workspace here. There, I've changed the workspace to reflect the negative 90 to 90 limit on theta 1 rather than the 0 to 180 limit. So now I'm going to pick up where I left off. I'm going to take the a1, a2, and a3 values and I'm going to carry them down into the inverse kinematics equations that I've written here. Now I know that I'm going to have to be doing this kind of a calculation a lot in the upcoming steps. So instead of doing this calculation by hand, again, I'm just going to put it into a MATLAB program. Here I've written a short MATLAB script to do the inverse kinematics given a starting point and I put in the start point and I can run this code and it will output for me the theta 1, theta 2, and d3. I go back to my MATLAB program and I'm just going to change the y to negative 4. That's the only difference between the start and the end points here. And when I run this code, I see that the only thing changed is theta 1. Theta 1 has become negative 38.66. In my start point, theta 1 was positive 38.66. So I can go back now and I'll plot this point also in my configuration space to make sure that the end point is also inside the workspace. So the end point will end up being somewhere over here where both the theta 1 and theta 2 are both negative. And this point is also inside the, uh, the rectangle. So, so far we're good to go. Both our start and end points are inside the workspace. And that's what we were trying to figure out by doing this whole step 3 where we transform the start and end points to the configuration space and make sure that they fall inside of our workspace. 
Now we get to the part of the process where we have to decide whether we just want the move to be efficient or if we want the move to be along a desired path in the Cartesian coordinate frame. In this example, I know the desired path. It's this half circle between the start and end point. So our next step is to plot the desired path in the Cartesian frame, which I've already done in the kinematic diagram. So I'm going to move on to step five, which is to segment or interpolate the path into equal segments. When I do this, what I need to get is the x, y, z points of each of these equal segments. I need to do that so that I can convert all of those points into configuration space using my inverse kinematics. I'm also going to use MATLAB to help me out with that, and I'll show you how I do that. The path that I want the end effector to follow is a half circle in Cartesian space. So what I have to do is I have to write here an equation for that path that I want the end effector to follow. That's easy in this particular example because I know that I want the end effector to follow a half circle in the yz plane. The equation for a circle in a plane is equal to the radius of the circle, which in this case is 4, times the cosine of the angle. In order to get a half circle, I want this angle around the circle to go from 0 degrees to 180 degrees. So here I'm just going to write a variable called angle. Then I'm going to go back up in my program and I'm going to define the variable angle as a vector that goes from 0 to 180. In this vector, I also need to specify the increment. In other words, this variable angle will go from 0 to 180 in some uh, equal steps. And here, I'm just going to define those equal steps as 1. You can put any value for the equal steps of this interpolation, but you have to realize that the larger this value is for your increment, the less accurate your path planning operation will be, and also the less calculations will be required. The smaller you make the increment, the more accurate the path planning will be, but you'll require more calculations. So it's kind of a trade-off between the amount of time and memory that you want to spend doing calculations versus how accurate you need the path planning to be. When I set my angle increment to be 1, that means that I'm splitting up my half circle into 180 individual steps. Now I've got the y value, I also have to put in the z value. The z value will be the other part of my half circle. It will be the sine of the angle. The x value in this move always remains the same. So all I have to do is get this x value to be a vector, just like my other numbers are vectors. Here I've specified my x to be a vector, just like the y and z are vectors, by using the MATLAB function ones. Ones creates a vector of ones of the size specified in the parentheses. So I created a vector of one row and 181 columns, each populated with the number one, and then I multiplied the whole thing by five. Now I can take each of these points along the path in XYZ space and convert all of them to theta one, theta two, D three space that is, into configuration space. 
and I'm going to do that in a loop. I've changed my inverse kinematics equations into a, a whole loop that instead of calculating only my start and end points, will calculate every point along my interpolated half circle path that I want the end effector to follow. After I've finished doing these calculations to convert the points in uh, Cartesian space into configuration space, I need to check that all of these points are inside my workspace. And the way that I do that, I can do that in MATLAB also, is to make sure that all of the theta 1s are within the acceptable range of theta 1, that all of the theta 2s are within the acceptable range for theta 2, and all of the D3s are in the acceptable range for D3. I can do that very quickly just by going like this. Theta 1 greater than 90, and then I take the sum of theta 1 greater than 90. That will give me an output that is a number that tells me how many of the theta 1 values are greater than 90. So when I run this, I get an answer that is 0, and that tells me that none of my theta 1 values are greater than 90. I can also check to see if any of the theta 1 values are less than negative 90. Or if any of the theta 2 values are greater than 180. Or if any of the theta 2 values are less than negative 180. And the same thing with D3. If there are any D3 values that are greater than 10, or if there are any D3 values that are less than 0, I run this code and I check that all of the answers should all be 0. And when I run this code, I find that one of the values is not 0, that I actually have many values of D3 that are less than 0. That tells me that my half circle path plan will have parts of it that fall outside of the workspace. To try and solve this problem, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the values of A1, A2, and A3. This is the kind of thing that you would do if you are designing a manipulator to follow uh, a target path. After doing this calculation, you would know that this manipulator with these values of A1, A2, and A3 cannot follow this half circle path. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to design my, manipula my manipulator with a smaller value of A2. Instead of having a2 be equal to 8, I'm going to change it and make it be equal to 6. So I go back to my code and I make my a2 value be equal to 6 and I run the code again. All of my values are 0 except the last one is 16. That tells me that I still have some values that are less than 0. Let's try, what if I make it 5? If I make a2 be equal to 5, all of my values are 0. That tells me that my intended path lies entirely inside the workspace. So I now know that my manipulator has to have a, an a2 length that is at least as short as 5. Once I have a path that falls with entirely within the workspace of my manipulator, the commands that I want to send to each of the joints is the values of theta 1, theta 2, and d3. I'm now going to check my work by making a couple of plots. 
The first thing I'm going to plot is the path of the end effector in Cartesian space. And I do that by plotting the x, y, z points that I specified. And here I'm going to do them. I'm going to plot those points as dots in a black color. And here I have the plot of the path that the end effector will follow in Cartesian space. And we see that this looks pretty good. It's a half circle. It goes between the two points that we intended it to go between. And so this looks pretty good. Now let's check what the path of the manipulator looks like in configuration space. Here we're going to plot the values of theta 1, theta 2, and d3. Here's the plot of the path of my manipulator in configuration space. Here, this is theta 1, this is theta 2, and this is d3. You'll notice that the path in configuration space does not look anything like a, uh, a half circle, but that's okay. We know that the path followed in configuration space is not the same as the path in Cartesian space. But what we want to see here is we want to make sure that the values in this plot do not go outside of our workspace. And remember that our workspace in theta 1 varied between negative 90 and 90. In theta 2, it went between um, negative 180 and 180. And in D3, it was between 0 and 10. So all of these points are inside of our workspace, and so that looks good. When we actually run this program it, to follow this path with our end effector, these values are the in this plot are the values that we're going to send um, one at a time in a row to our controller to get the servos to go to each of these different angles. So let's briefly look back over the procedure that we followed to do this path planning example. We started out by finding the workspace in configuration space. And we found that by either knowing or specifying the limits on the range of angles or displacements that each of the joints are allowed to go between. Next, we found the start and end points in Cartesian space, and we placed points in Cartesian space representing the start and end points where we wanted to do our pick and place operations. Next, we transformed those start and end points to configuration space using the inverse kinematics to make sure that those points are both in the workspace. Then, we plotted our desired path in the Cartesian frame. In this example, we said that we wanted the path to be a half circle, but it doesn't have to be a half circle. It could be a parabola, it could be a straight line, it could be whatever path you would like in the Cartesian frame. It helps if the path that you choose has an equation that you can write easily when you put this into uh, your program for step number five, which is to segment or interpolate the path into equal segments. Once you have this path split up into segments, we convert those interpolated points into the configuration space. And we did that in our program with a loop that looped through each of the points uh, or interpolated points and put them into the inverse kinematics equations to get all of those points in configuration space. Finally, we plotted both the positions of the end effector and the configuration space so that we could see that the paths looked correct. We checked all of the points in configuration space, all of the interpolated points, 
to make sure that all of them are inside the workspace in configuration space. And finally, if we were actually running this on a manipulator, we would send commands from the configuration space 